So what's your understanding of co-production buy-in? In terms of what does co-production buy-in look like within your organisations? I'm in um, an explicit lived experience role, but that is fairly is pretty senior within the organisation. So co-production is um, kind of key and like central to everything we do. So I guess in terms of buy-in, I understand that as how do you bring an organisation, services, teams and individuals on board to sort of use the principles of co-production and create those safe spaces for it? So that's how I interpret it buy-in? I mean it is a massive challenge I've got uh, just had two years lived experience of homelessness I've got a part-time job here at which is a health and well-being hub in Exeter for people experiencing homelessness but one of the things that's really striking is the I think one of the things that can get potentially people on board is that the system isn't working people are involved in a vicious circle of you know watched it many times himself they come off the street, they go into supportive accommodation, they get a flat, they lose the flat, they go back to the street, they go back to, and it's, I've, you know, I've witnessed this round and round. So there's a financial cost and there's obviously a, a misery cost to the person that's having to do all that. And, you know, it just highlights that the system isn't working. So I think if we can come up, you know, with some new ideas, but it, it is really challenging to try and do any co-production I've got to be honest yeah so we have a co-produced um leadership uh with our diet like so there's me and our so we bring that professional lived experience at the heart of it to try and model co-production at every level so yeah like I guess I act as like a, a bridge builder so I always come from the voice and the the view of the of people who use our services but that's not in a in an I'm against our services kind of way it's like how do we all work together to make things better it's actually just the belief from everyone that this is actually leading somewhere that this actually works you you know as I said you know you need that buying from the top people all the way down to the actual people who are actually with the lived experience because otherwise there's any doubt in that and people won't talk or there's often a slight scepticism about you know what is this and is it actually going to make any difference because let's face it we've all been here before in focus groups which is a common one but you know for me yeah buy-in just literally about actually people believing that this will work and that this will lead to some change. For me it's about actions because actions speak louder than words and I think Often when strategic decision makers want co-production, their actions don't follow through. So for me, full buy-in is around what that really looks like in practical terms. Are they actually doing co-production the way we see um, that it's using best practice? Is that the way or is it more consultation and involvement? That for me, um, it's all about actions. Buy-in. Um, it's important to acknowledge it as it as actions rather than words. I think a lot of people, as, as we're saying, especially at a strategic level, um, buy in in theory um, or buy in or pay lip surface to you know co production and you know wanting to have it as part of an organisation, but don't necessarily put that into practice or practice it in a trauma informed way or in a, just an informed way generally. So I think um, yeah, buy in has to be. Um, has to be supported by um, yeah action rather than just sort of uh, talking about it. The trouble buying is, I think, I, I come from a gambling harms sort of lived experience background here, and one of the issues we is that lived experience and co-production is too often seen as lived experience is seen as a focus group rather than a participant and a driver. Uh, and the other thing is that increasingly in in certainly in our sector, the funding that's out there increasingly comes of a rider that it's encouraging partnership and involvement with lived experience. Uh, but the danger then becomes organisations are partnering, looking for partners, lived experience partners, simply to fulfil, if you want, the funding requirements without really caring about uh, the benef- benefits, the purpose, the reason for lived experience being involved. It is. Uh, some people, yeah, I think it does appear as just another focus group or anything that's participation is just oh yeah it's just another very feedback um so i'm not sure that people out there just generally to the the person on the street they actually know what the difference is 
you know, it's just another term that starts coming out a lot. The property, oh, it's a multimedia, it's like, you know, it's another media term. Um, and I'm not sure that that's clear. I've definitely been talking about um, sort of a top down and bottom up approach and saying that. So, so the direction we're going in our organisation, and I think um, my <laughs> that said it about paying lip service to sort of what people are asking for to get funded and tick boxes. For me, one of the ways to overcome that is that employ people in explicit lived experience roles at all levels of the organisation because we don't forget the co-production part of it <laughs> and helps the authenticity. So we're working on a top-down structure that has processes and structures in place that make it safe for the organization but it needs the bottom up in place for it to actually make a difference to people on the ground so like for us it's like the way I talk about it is it's all about reducing power dynamics wherever possible and sort of having all those perspectives in the room to create something unique that none of us could on our own but that goes through to like for me if you if you go into a service and like for care, like if you, if you go into somebody's using services, I might be idealistic, but I want everyone to walk in and see themselves as an equal partner co-producing their care. Uh, And that if they want to use that experience, that they can see clear pathways um, throughout the organization at all levels of how to do that, if that's something they choose to do. But that co-production is is at that level as well when you walk through the door. That's how I would like to communicate it and for it to be seen. So for me, it's definitely a top down and a bottom up that you need the structures to keep it safe and to allow it to grow, I guess. I think a big part of that is employing um, and having roots into employment for people with lived experience within, within an organisation, um, but also ensuring that they're supported in that role. Um, and like you said, having the structure in place to do that for sure. We work with the job centre um, in the DWP and <laughs> to um, make their uh, service more trauma informed and psychologically informed as well. And part of that was a mystery shopping um exercise in which someone with lived experience of multiple and complex needs um would go in to the to the service and and review it and there and then it would be part of a review and reassessment and redesign of how the service would look and operate i think we're quite aware that it could potentially create a bit of confrontational or adversarial sort of environment between managers about how services are designed and that sort of thing but um I think what was important to kind of maintain buy-in at every point was that sort of constant discussion and constant sort of bringing people together and creating safe spaces where people were able to share why they might feel a bit defensive about things or and why that isn't necessarily the approach to take um with it so yeah that was I think that was a good example of good good buy-in and how to maybe sort of just be open and keep a dialogue open around services who are wanting to develop um but aren't necessarily sure about how to go about it I got involved in my local neighborhood renewal program and at every single level within the program there were um people that lived in in the neighborhood um, so the chair of the actual partnership was a resident um, with their lived experience of living in that particular neighbourhood. There were residents involved in all staff recruitment. There were residents involved in all policy making. There were residents involved in all working groups. So every at every single level within the whole programme, um, there were people with lived experience of their own neighbourhood making the decisions along the way with the staff. And that so that I had a quite high, high level of threshold when I started doing this work. And I feel like it's been it's been a roller coaster since then, because we've gone through periods of time where um, nationally public services have have not wanted to um, necessarily involve people um, in co-production in the design of their services. And I feel like we are coming back round to I'm now working in a programme, community transformation programme for mental health. Um, in, and that's that's my main role is working with lived experience um, people with lived experience in in being involved in that program it's still not at the level where um, you would say that it was being co-produced but it's a 
it's a good beginning, I think, to those conversations. There are um, people with lived experience being involved in all levels of meetings, but I think still at the end of the day, the decisions are being made um, outside of those meetings. Um, we work with disabled people in the city to do audits. Um, so, and that really is um, the definition of co-production for me. We literally work alongside people with disabilities and walk around venues and streets and places and we look at them together and we write up the report together and we present them together. So there are different different ways of doing co-production and, and they don't always have to be strategic, but um, yeah, there are, yeah, there's a, a different level can, depending on who you're working with, I think, on what that might look like. Co-production really, it also varies upon the, the person in the role, you, you know, and who you recruit into it. You can't sort of say, oh yeah, I, I want this particular person because that's part of the co-production so much as you have to look at the skills that they can bring to the role. Kind of, kind of similar again, um, but I'm coming from a homelessness um, sector background, and I think historically there's a lot that's quite entrenched about an us and them, particularly within housing settings between, you know, clients or guests or however you, however people who work in those settings would refer to them, um, and I think that that has often been a barrier in creating levels of involvement, kind of reaching all the way up to kind of full co-production in those settings. I mean, something that uh, kind of feels like a soft kind of approach, but a way of dealing with that I've found is just being really transparent about those power dynamics and naming them um, rather than everyone sort of being aware of them and, uh, and not saying anything. And it's sort of, um, yeah, it just, and it, I think that kind of that goes some way to uh, breaking down uh, what is based on is the stigma um, and kind of goes towards building that sort of more equal um, relationship in co-production. But yeah, that is definitely difficult when those sorts of ideas are quite entrenched or built into the language of the system or built into the language or policies that need to be reviewed. I found the same challenges as everybody else has uh, mentioned. I think one of the big ones is the misuse of language as well. Like people talk about co-production, but what they mean is consultation or involvement. So I think breaking down some of that legacy stuff is a barrier. But the other one that I find really interesting is um, if we're talking about equal partnerships, then people should be paid equally like um, or according to it. So we've gone down the road of writing um, job descriptions for specific tasks and then getting them matched and saying so you can't expect somebody to do that voluntarily um, that deserves x amount like of payment um, and saying you know you wouldn't ask a psychologist or anybody else to come and contribute for free so why do we ask people with lived experience to so holding that line but then trying to work with those services to identify the money when they're at the planning stage to account for that because if you miss those conversations there's no money left to play with so it's like the barrier for me is trying to get in that early to make sure there's a thread um a budget that accounts for that um and I've been quite challenging in not allowing things to go forward because I've said it's like it's exploitary and if what do we stand for like if we let that happen but then you don't want to make it so they never even try so I, I find that like an interesting balance to try and have as well as everything that everyone else said. I think from um, me and my team's experience um, you know wherever we go and um, you know who, whoever we try and include people just want to know that um, what they say is 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 going to make a difference you know and their, their time and contribution is is going to lead to something because if it doesn't then it just ends up in meeting notes or it ends up lost, you know, in something that's fed back to a service that doesn't get acted on. Um, and we sometimes don't even know whether it does get acted on or, or looked at. Um, and we do uh, have, you know, a, a forum where where people can have the say and we do try and, um, you know, uh, start projects from the beginning with people. But we always know that it tends to only get so far and then come the barriers. So it can be, you know, it, it, it can be senior management. Um, it can be just that something's going to take an awfully long time 
for people to understand that what's been you know said in a meeting or um or or, or said in a service somewhere actually really does matter um, much more than you know the position that you hold and the, you know and the job that you have and and that you know should be uh, considered just as much so yeah um th- there are loads of barriers everywhere um but we always think well any sort of involvement is better than no involvement, but uh, it's, it, there are always pushbacks. Um, and I would say that, you know, people um, who we know, our colleagues, tend to be, um, you know, the hardest people to convince. Now, expert link, David Ford, our CEO, for those of you, I think most of you probably know him. Um, he's been doing um, co-production for a really long time. Um, and so he speaks about profiling people. Um, so in terms of their their buy-in, their involvement, um, sort of understanding what is actually important for them in their role or their lives. So say, for example, a CEO profiling them, what's important to them and how does what we're doing with co-production benefit their role or what they're doing um, and trying to approach it in, in that sort of way um, in terms of just saying, you know, that we need this to happen to improve services actually understanding where people are at um and the same goes for sort of our colleagues and um service users or clients um what what's important to them and what do they actually what do they actually want i think for lots of people it's just an understanding of what we're talking about an understanding of terminology because i think lots of time when we throw co-production has been interchanged for other methods of consultation and i think it's a real um, it's really important that we are all, we all understand exactly what we're talking about. And I think sometimes it's not that they're reticent to do it. I think they just don't understand what we're talking about when we talk about co-production. So I think there's an element of um, information sharing and training for particularly for public sector. I think it ha- we are talking about mostly public sector managers because um, I think that's where we find there's a, a, a mismatch of, of understanding of terms um, and I think sometimes it's just suggesting it so for me I can be in a meeting and sometimes it's saying we're talking about recruiting staff and sometimes I'll just say okay we could have a service user on that that um, recruitment panel oh okay yeah I hadn't really thought about that or you know can we talk about involving service users before we even get to the planning stage and sometimes it's just rather than bring them in sort of three months down the line when we've planned the planning stage. So sometimes it's just being there at the right point to to make these suggestions, I think. I think it's more than that. I think there is an inherent um, challenge within the work that we do. I don't know exactly where all of you come from, but in the end, it's a very patriarchal system that relies on the, the knowledge owners and the knowledge takers. And the very existence of lived experience work challenges some of the historical context of that. So, and also on a, I guess on a really basic level for some professions, it might be, so what is my role here if these other people can do a good job? So I think there is systemically a lot more challenge. For me, from the learning I've learned of overcoming that, is absolute visibility of explicit lived experience roles at every level of the organisation, because you'll find less resistance when it's around involvement and getting people to focus groups and sitting on interviews. You try getting them into more where they're decision makers and at the table where there's decisions. So I think there is a misunderstanding over language, but I think it runs way deeper than that.